my name is Stefan Ziegler. I'm the Director for Signal Analysis and Artificial Intelligence at Mincor. I'm presenting today with Shishir Shikar, who is the Worldwide Manager for Energy Power and Utilities Industry at the MathWorks. The, an approach of machine learning and deep learning that provides risk categorization to underground utility distribution cable systems. So underground distribution cable system failures can be predicted. Each year, millions of people and thousands of businesses are impacted by underground cable system failures. Also, it's important to know that over the past 40 years, cable and accessory manufacturers have used offline 1560 hertz PD testing of a specific PC spectrum sensitivity levels. So different approaches for cable system maintenance are possible, reactive, preventive, and predictive. Predictive maintenance begins with understanding how cable system failures occur. Analyzing and interpreting results from partial discharge measurements taken in the field can be a very complex task for humans. So machine learning and deep learning approaches were used to solve specific challenges with partial de defect classification. Machine learning algorithms and deep learning algorithms are used to automatically identify and categorize specific markers of defects contained in the partial discharge measurements. These algorithms are used to classify different defect types by risk of going to failure soon. Differentiating cables with high to low risk defects, along with those that are defect free, enables predictive maintenance. Examples of identified defects will be presented. The predictive maintenance workflow is being presented at the end of this presentation. So why performing predictive maintenance? As I already said, each year millions of people and thousands of businesses are without power or impacted by an underground cable system failure. And those failures can be predicted. So identifying cable defects before failure begins with understanding how cable system failures occur. Differentiating cables with high to low risk defects along with those that are defect free, and by the way, the defect free um, group is quite large, enables predictive cable system maintenance. So over 99% of solid dielectric cable system failures are associated with that effect that's called partial discharge. Partial discharge is a slow um, degeneration of the cable insulating material, which eventually leads to a failure. So over 40 years, cable and accessory manufacturers have used offline 50 or 60 hertz PD testing with specific sensitivity levels as a quality control standard. So the manufacturers are using in their factory an offline test. They excite the cable with an over voltage at 50 or 60 hertz sinusoidal voltage. They do at the same time sensitivity and calibration measurement to ensure that the, the measurement makes actually sense. And it's done in a shielded environment in the factory. So in a Faraday cage, but that's how the ambient noise gets removed. But how do you do the same thing in the field? In the field, it's a little different. You don't have that Faraday cage or the EMC chamber. You need to actually have equipment that is exciting the cube at 50, 60 hertz, removes the noise, and you can calibrate to the specific standards as the manufacturers do, and collect the data. The reason I'm saying this is it's very important if you want to predict the future condition of an underground cable system that the measurement is as close as possible to the actual operating conditions. Very commonly used is the reactive approach for maintaining cable system assets. So a cable system failure causes an unpredicted service interruption. But that's not the only bad thing about it. Economically, the owner of the cable um, loses a lot of money. First of all, the service crews have to be sent out 
and it's at an unknown and unpredictable time if the reactive approach that costs quite a bit of money, the customer is not uh, pleased with an outage and the loss of image from an energy provider is, is a very important thing to consider. The liability indices are impacted, SADI, SAFI, SADI, and MAFI, and those should be kept at specific levels at, that are prescribed. And then, very dangerous could be the potential collateral damage. Just think about uh, manholes, manhole covers that could fly up in the air during a cable failure. All these things that are of high visibility and are not just causing collateral damage, but damage the reputation of an energy provider. So as Stephen just mentioned, why reactive approach is not a good approach? Because it can be very expensive to replace that piece of cable. So what we have seen historically, many of the utility companies use reactive approach to do maintenance. Most recently, they have been moving from reactive to more preventative approach, that is do maintenance at a regular intervals. But again, there is still a problem with that. You have to do unnecessary maintenance, and it can be a wasteful of, uh, of time and money. So how do you how do you save both on time and money? Uh, and one way to do that is predictive maintenance. However, doing predictive maintenance is not easy. Forecasting when a problem will arise with an equipment, it is a, it's a very difficult thing to do forecast. So now we have technologies that enable you to do predictive maintenance. Technologies such as machine learning and deep learning can help you identify when your equipment might fail on the field. And we will show you how you can actually develop this predictive maintenance algorithms uh, for different application areas, such as underground cables. So when you're trying to develop a predictive maintenance algorithm, you could use multiple approaches. Either you could do a model-driven approach, which is a white box approach, which uses first principles modeling, or you could do a black box approach, which is more data-driven approach, which is on the method of applying data-driven modeling, that is the data that you have from sensors. However, there are both pros and cons for both of these approaches. The model-driven approach combined with data-driven approach can be a better technique because that lets you to do highly accurate predictive model. So in many cases, you might have data or you know how does a failure look like. In many cases, you may not know how does a failure look like. So when you know, when you do not know how does a failure look like, you can actually develop system models, run multiple simulations, and then use the data from those simulation, combine it with sensor data to develop predictive algorithms. As I mentioned, you could use AI techniques to develop predictive maintenance algorithms. So when we talk about AI, what is actually AI? Artificial intelligence uses different techniques, which is either machine learning technique or a deep learning technique. You would use machine learning or deep learning depending on the type of data you have or also depending on if you know what does failure look like. So if you do not have labeled data or if you do not know what does failure look like, you generally use unsupervised learning where you are trying to use clustering techniques. When you know what does failure look like or you have labeled data, then you mostly take supervised learning approach. You use techniques such as classification or regression. Another approach is by using deep learning techniques. So when you have a large amount of data, especially when you have you know time series data or image data, you could also use deep learning techniques. And we will show you when when can you use certain type of techniques and when it is more useful to use deep learning or when it is more useful to use machine learning. The main difference between machine learning and deep learning is that machine learning typically involves some kind of feature extraction. So when you have a signal waveforms or hundreds of signal waveforms, 
and you want to work with certain features, then you typically use machine learning techniques. Deep learning does not typically involve feature extraction. You kind of skip that step, and that's an added advantage of deep learning. So again, going back to the differences between machine learning and deep learning. As I said, deep learning performs end-to-end -end learning. That is, you are skipping the feature extraction uh, process. So basically, we are doing end-to-end -end learning by, by learning features, representations, and tasks directly from data, which could be images, text, or sound data, or data from your sensors. The main difference between machine learning and deep learning is Deep learning algorithms generally scale with data. You typically want to use machine learning when you have huge amount of data. Whereas if you're using machine learning approach for a lot of a lot of data, your models will generally saturate. So when you're working with huge amount of data, it will be better to use deep learning approaches. So Many people in the utility industry ask, what kind of data should we have before we can use machine learning or deep learning techniques? It doesn't really matter. You can use different types of data. However, depending on the type of data, you might you might use a different a different approaches or different techniques. For example, if you're working with numeric data, you generally use machine learning or NSTM. If you have time series data, data from your sensors, or if you have text data, that is logs uh, recorded by your linemen, by your crews in different uh, uh, in, in different formats, you can actually use either CNN convolutional neural networks or NSTM, that is long short term memory. If you are working with image data, if you have images of your assets uh, or if you have vegetation images, you generally want to use CNN techniques. As Shishio has already mentioned, different types of learning approaches lend themselves to the application case. In our case, we have chosen two approaches. One is the machine learning approach, and the other one is the deep learning approach when it comes to partial discharge signal waveforms. Those uh, partial discharge signals are time series digitized uh, signals, and they lend themselves very well to you know, a machine learning model where the extracted features of the time series are being processed, or of to a deep learning approach, the long short-term memory approach where the waveforms are actually classified based on the features in the time series data. The reason to develop such a system is simple. It is very difficult for humans to interpret partial discharge signals very consistent. So you might have humans that interpret signals one way and other humans that interpret them the other way. So we would like to have a system that is actually learning from humans and at the same time being very precise and consistent. That's why we have chosen those two approaches. In this example, I would like to demonstrate to you that the machine learning approach that was based on a booster tree methodology was very successful on a data pool of 353,000 labeled waveform parameters. The waveforms were actually labeled by human expert analysts. They were not labeled one by one, as you can imagine. They were labeled with a very specific tool that humans can use and classify partial discharge signals with bulk operation and other signal processing needs. So we found out that out of 43 extracted features, only eight were necessary to predict to the overall accuracy of 94%. So 94% is, uh, is a success. We wanted to find out how much closer to 100% we can go, and I'll give you a little update in a couple slides about that. The next approach that we applied to our challenge was the deep learning approach on the partial discharge time series. So we used a long short-term memory approach where we 
used the time domain signal as a feature and as well added other features on there. And this time we employed this model on a pool of about 900,000 human labeled signal waveforms. And we found out the overall validation accuracy is 93%. As Shishir has mentioned before, for deep learning, it is more advisable to actually have more data. So we possess more data and studies have been performed in larger pools, but I wanted to give you an example on about 900,000 human labeled waveforms. So 93% is not bad either, but the question is why isn't it working closer to 100%? So here are the reasons. When you look at this curve, the probability is being plotted against the partial discharge signals. And they have been sorted by probability from one being a true partial discharge, very clear, to zero, like a very clear non-partial discharge signal. And you see that you can categorize that pool of data into three main buckets. One is the clear partial discharge, the other one is the clear non-partial discharge, and in the middle, there's a transition which you would have wished would be a little steeper. Those are the ambiguous waveforms. So when we went back and looked especially at the ambiguous pool, we found out that some of those signals actually have features that make them look either way. And this depends more or less on the signal data quality. So we know the inputs have to be of a specific quality if you would like to classify very precisely. So we can either do better training in that zone, or we can clean up our signals to begin with. That's more of a signal capture and signal processing issue. Or we can apply different models to that specific zone in order to have a higher validation accuracy. As you know, working with Images is far more easier compared to working with signals, and they and and we kind of use the same idea when we are trying to use deep learning approaches for signal applications. So, as Stephen explained, how they use LSTM uh, on on those signals. So, taking it forward from the same example you could actually convert those signal data or time series data into images or, or into time frequency transformations. And that, is, that makes it very easy for you to interpret or analyze those partial discharge signals. And you will see how converting these time series data into time frequency domain, you can actually identify risks in underground cables by looking at different image patterns. So this specific slide shows you how a LSTM, long short term memory network is being trained inside MATLAB. Um, I told you about this pool of 900,000 signals before. So when actually selecting data for training, there are considerations about ratio between uh, positive features and negative tagged features, the uh, specific number of epochs you want to run, the number of iterations, and the specific data conditioning before you start training a model. And in this case, the model training takes several hours, sometimes even several days. And we found out it is as important to condition the data than to find the right training method in an LSTM network. As I mentioned before, 93 or 94% accuracy is pretty good, but we would like to improve that so that the model compared to a human is almost equally as good. Another approach that Shishir has mentioned before that helps us to learn from information is the convolutional neural network approach. The convolutional neural network lends itself very well to 
image recognition or feature recognition on images. So partial discharge data can also be converted into plots where the partial discharge magnitude and picoculor is being plotted against the phase of the excitation voltage. And those are the two pictures you see at the bottom of this presentation. Those actually have significance. Those pictures can reveal the nature of the partial discharge, discharge defect in a cable. Specifically, when partial discharge defects are based on associated electrical treeing, which is a micro defect in the cable insulation, those defects are much higher of risk of failure than other types of defects. So we are interested and our customers are interested in finding out the high risk defects that eventually make a cable fail. In this case, we found out that the convolutional neural network was trained very successfully on identifying those partial discharge defects related to electrical treating. That allowed us and enabled us to derive a partial discharge severity factor that is actually serving now as a risk categorization for specific partial discharge defects. And this is done automatically with the machine, so the human will be alerted that there might be defects that might be more risky than others, which actually helps us to inform our customers that there are specific defects in the cable that need much more urgent attention than other defects. So it allows actually the operational uh, people at network owners, cable network owners, to categorize and classify and prioritize, therefore, repairs on, on cables. Here are just a few examples of those electrical tree type defects that the machine has found automatically for us. And sure enough, when we looked back into data, went a little closer into the data, we found out those would be the ones that a cable network owner should take care first of. And this is something that is all being retained in the database that automatically categorizes and prioritizes risk of partial discharge defects going to failure. So one question that we often get asked by engineers who are trying to develop predictive maintenance algorithms is where do we start? So one thing that I often ask them is, do you have data? So if you have operational data and you know how does failure look like, you have logged those failures, you can use that data to develop predictive maintenance algorithms and get insights. But in many cases, you may not have failure data. You may not have logged failures in the past. So how do you then develop predictive maintenance algorithms? So at that point of time, you could use another approach called digital twin approach, where you could actually develop simulation models of various equipment, and then you run multiple simulations, uh, define faults, and then generate data. So you can use that data, simulated data, to then develop predictive maintenance algorithm to gain insights. In, in, in other cases, if you already have operational data and you know how this failure looks like, and you can also build digital twins, models of equipment, you can actually use both the approaches. You can then run multiple simulations, combine the results of the simulations with a known failure data, and then develop predictive maintenance algorithms. In this case, you'll have a much better outcome because you have a lot more data to train your machine learning and deep learning algorithms. And lastly, depending on the type of application, you can deploy this predictive maintenance algorithm either to the cloud or to the uh, hardware edge devices. So once you have built this predictive maintenance algorithms, what next? So in many cases, you can also go beyond 
doing predictive maintenance. You can also identify the remaining useful life of your equipment. That is, you can actually know well in advance how much remaining useful life of that, equi of that equipment exists so that you can do planning much ahead of time to replace those equipment on the field. Now, to develop remaining useful life algorithms, there are multi multiple methods. You could use the narrative based method. If you have run to failure data, which has captured data over system's lifetime, if you could use degradation methods. If the only information that you have is threshold values and where the equipment has not failed in the past, or you could use survival methods. Then you have only data that's available which corresponds to your failed machine. So you can use different methods to develop remaining useful life algorithms. Yes, as she here has just mentioned, the remaining useful life is a very important question that needs to be answered, especially when you maintain and operate underground cable systems. The costs are very high when you need to replace a cable system. So the question that always comes up when everyone would like to answer is, how much remaining useful life is in my underground cable system? And the remaining useful life um, is not just a question of time to failure, it's also a question when economically it's not viable anymore to operate an underground cable system. So typically, and that's why there is a curve that we'd like to explain briefly, a cable failure develops over time and long before the cable actually fails, that defect is already active in a cable. All this plotted here on the X axis is time and on the Y axis is the partial discharge inception voltage of the defect. The higher the voltage, the less likely it is that a transient event, a transient over voltage event, which means it's a very temporary short event, is there that can ignite and make this partial discharge defect active for a very short time. So there are a few things that you know that can actually make a defect active. Lightning, if a lightning strike is close to cable or hits actually a riser that is connected to cable, that cable will see an over voltage and the already existing partial discharge defect is becoming active for a short amount of time during this event and continues to grow and degrade the insulating material or something. Something is actually a methodology where artificial over voltage or high voltage pulses are injected in an underground power cable to find a failure. Something is not helping you to find an existing failure. It's also continuing to degrade existing defects that are elsewhere in the cable because they are over voltage pulses. Or switching events, switching off cables is obviously generating transient over voltage for a short amount of time. So every time a partial discharge defect is active in a cable, the inception voltage partial discharge inception voltage is decreasing. So eventually it will decrease to the level of the operating voltage. And the operating voltage, which is always on, this partial discharge will be continuously being active and very quickly go to failure. So somewhere in between here, and this is between the blue and the yellow shaded region, a condition-based assessment our discharge assessment has been performed. So we have a point in time measurement of the condition of the cable. Based on that one point in time, it should be possible and it is possible to actually give predictions about how much longer does it take before the cable will go to failure. And it will get to it what else you would need to know to make that prediction. So, in summary, what does a predictive maintenance algorithm actually do? So, there are actually three steps to developing your predictive maintenance algorithm. And basically, you are, you are by using predictive maintenance algorithm, you are making decisions on your important equipment. So, basically, you have data, and then depending on the, on these questions, is my system operating normally? You would generally do anomaly detection. 
if your system is behaving abnormally you would do condition monitoring and if you want to know how much longer can you operate your equipment then basically you try to develop remaining useful life estimation and by looking at these different um, aspects of predictive maintenance then you take certain decisions to either replace your cables or you perform maintenance Now, as Shishir just mentioned, the remaining useful life depends on many variables. For underground power cable systems, it mainly depends on transient over voltages, as I have just explained, something and other over voltages that are artificially generated, the operation of the asset, let's say the load flow, the current, the temperature of the cable, and also the age and other intrinsic assets. Uh, for instance, how old is the cable? What manufacturer is it? What kind of jacket type does the cable have or does it even have a jacket? So when you look to the very left on this slide, you see a whole layer of different information that is actually being used to predict the remaining useful life of a cable. Weather data, you know, when lightning strikes happen, where they happen, um, geographical information, how likely is it that this cable will be flooded or not. Um, all these kinds of information flow into the model that helps you to predict how long will the cable endure before it actually fails. So as I explained before, you could also deploy your your algorithms on the cloud or uh, on on a piece of hardware. So this slide basically talks about the different options that you have when it comes to deployment. So so depending on the different types of applications, uh, for example, if you're trying to do asset health monitoring and predictive maintenance of your um, transmission towers, transmission lines. Or insulators on transmission towers, um, or if you're trying to do uh, vegetation management, you typically run uh, or you do surveys using helicopters. Or nowadays, companies are trying to explore drone technology. So basically, your drone is flying over the transmission lines, flying over the uh, the right of way, and take images of vegetation, take images of transmission uh, towers, transmission lines, and other equipment. And basically, once the images have been taken. The images are sent to the cloud. When you have this MATLAB code as slash algorithm that's running on the cloud, and then um, and then giving you uh, results of uh, 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 results from those predictive algorithms, and then you can then use your results to take specific decisions. So depending on the type of application, you could do deployment either on the cloud or on the hardware. So in summary, um, you know, as Stephen has gone through a very good application of doing predictive maintenance of underground cables. So if you're trying to build similar applications for other equipment, you could take either a data-driven approach or a, or a digital twin approach, or you could do both of it. Depending on if you have historical data, if you have what is data that kind of shows what does fault look like. You can combine that data with simulated data and then use the data to train your predictive models. So one thing, one important thing to note here is a lot of time is actually spent on doing pre-processing because you might have data from multiple sources. And in the beginning, I showed you a slide that talks about different forms of data. So if you're combining set data, signal data, uh, uh, digital data, non-digital data, text data. So it, it can be a huge task to actually combine all this data that's in different formats before you can actually even run them through these predictive models. So on an average, engineers might spend 50 to 60 percent of their time only doing pre-processing. So that becomes a very important step. The better your data, the better your predictive models, and the better your results. So once you have the data, you want to make sure that you clean up the data and the data is in the right format. 
before you can actually start developing predictive models. Once you have those predictive models, you can then deploy them on the cloud or on the hardware, and then you can use them for different applications. Thank you so much for your attention. Shishir and I would be very happy to answer any possible questions that you might have for us. Thank you very much.